Okay, so um, the committee meeting is now beginning. It's been recorded and broadcast. And uh, to advise members the usual mobile phone rules, please. Yep. Yep. Um, and through the, we'll proceed through the agenda. First of all, apologies, and the clerk has received apologies from Trevor Clark, Trevor Lunn, George Robinson, and Pat Sheehan. Uh, item two, uh, to inform members that you have the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of March, which are at page five of the pack. Uh, are members content that that is a true reflection of the meeting? Yes. Yep. Okay, so if that's the case, I can sign them. Uh, in terms of uh, matters arising, uh, which is on page 10 of the pack, um, at last week's meeting, the committee had agreed that the clerk would look at previous committees and identify any issues raised in relation to the processing of LCMs, the legislative consent motions. In the 2011 to 2016 committee, they did encounter an issue when considering the Westminster Child Care Payment Bill, uh, and it highlighted the need for early and full engagement between the departments and committees, and I think that will be somewhat replicated in the next few minutes. Um, the clerk has drafted a response on that, um, and it is in the pack there. Are members content with that, or would they like to alter it in any way? It's fine. Happy enough. Okay, that's fine. Well, then we can move on then to the historical institutional abuse rules, uh, SL1, and Craig will just bring Gareth and Mark in for us. Hi, table eight for you today uh, at the far end of the room, but uh, hopefully we'll not have to shout too much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, gentlemen, for coming along today. Um, there was a briefing paper was emailed to all members on Friday evening. It's at page 18 of the table pack, and a draft copy of the rules can be found at page 25 of the table pack. So I can welcome uh, Mark and Gareth along. This is your second visit, I think, or maybe even third occasion up to the committee. Uh, Mark, so I think we can forgo the introductions. Yes. We all know who we are. Um, maybe I could just pass over to yourselves to give us an introduction to the statutory well, rules. Thank you very much, Chair, and th thank you for the opportunity to come today and uh, talk about the, uh, the rules. Uh, as the committee is aware from the previous briefing on the redress scheme for HIA, um, a key aspect of the critical path for implementation is the development of the rules that will actually direct the redress board's procedures, how, how, how it will actually operate. Um, this is, of course, just one of many strands of work that, that has been required. Um, alongside the rules, we've been working with colleagues in the Shadow Redress Board to develop an application system and to make the first appointments to that board. There's been important work through the interim advocate with victims and survivors on the whole application process and on, on the application form. Uh, and the board itself has assigned staff and has um, developed its protocols and its processes. Mr Justice Colton was appointed by the Lord Chief Justice before Christmas as the President-elect of the Redress Board. Uh, and since then, there have been intensive rounds of work that have been undertaken between the officials in the Redress Board, officials in TEO, um, our solicitors and the Office of the Legislative Council to produce or to develop a previous initial draft of the rules and to ensure that they cover all the procedural areas that the Board will require. It's important that I emphasise that the rules are indeed procedural. What they do is they put flesh on the bones of the Historical Institutional Abuse Act 2019. Uh, as a piece of secondary legislation, it can only do what the primary legislation specifically allows them to do. So there's no free run in drafting the rules. They have to be uh, uh, covered by the primary legislation. Gareth will take you through uh, some of the key areas in a moment, but the rules deal, for example, with how applications are made what information is needed to support uh, an application, and how decisions are communicated. The plan has been to make the rules this week, with them commencing on Tuesday. We recognise that that breaches the 21-day rule, uh, and in light of that, we gave the examiner of statutory rules an advanced copy, uh, and Gareth will say more about the consultation arrangements uh, that were in place around the rules with um, victims and survivors. So I'll just hand over to Gareth and I can take it through to Well, on those uh, consultation arrangements and how we consulted and engaged with victims and survivors in the development of the, the rules. Um, last year, as part of the overall consultation on HIA policy and legislation, we consulted on an earlier draft of the rules. Uh, at that stage, we called them subordinate legislation, uh, and we indicated that we would be working with 
with an incoming redress board on their detail. Uh, in the consultation paper, we described how the rules had dealt with the key interfaces that victims and survivors would have with the board, uh, with what they would need to submit with an application form, with the proofs of identity that would be needed, uh, the arrangements for oral hearings, which were confined to exceptional circumstances, uh, how the board would request any further information that it needed, uh, how victims and survivors would be notified of the decisions of the board and the arrangements for appealing. Uh, we also explained how legal expenses in obtaining a solicitor's help in applying would be covered from the public purse. Now, 526 responses were received to the consultation overall. How um, many? But those dealt with policy Mr. issues. 526. 526. 526. Um, those dealt with policy issues uh, and issues about the procedural rules themselves uh, really didn't feature in those consultation responses. Following the appointment of the President-elect of the Redress Board and engagement with him on what the detail of the rules needed to specify, in February we again engaged with victims and survivors groups on the rules through the offices of the Interim Advocate and an advanced draft of the rules was shared at that stage. The Interim Advocate organised a briefing with representatives of the groups and I attended to take them through the main areas covered by the rules. Um, if I could turn to the rules themselves and highlight some of the, the key features. Um, rules 3 and 4 deal with applications and they reflect the Hart recommendation that it should be possible to deal with the great majority of applications based on the papers without requiring a victim or survivor to take part in an oral hearing. Uh, the rules allow the board to determine the form in which applications are made and board officials have engaged with victims and survivors on that. They allow forms to be submitted electronically to help speed up their, their processing. Uh, they ask people to submit their birth certificate and one of the same forms of identity as are required to vote, but they give the board discretion where such forms of identity aren't available for whatever reason. Uh, rules 5 and 6 mean that in the unusual circumstances where someone made an application but died before it had been decided, their spouse, civil partner or cohabiting partner will be able to continue with it. And that reflects the general arrangements in the Act for family members of deceased persons to bring claims. Uh, I want to highlight particularly to the committee Rule 7. Uh, because the board is required to approach the institution in which someone resided for corroborating information. But this rule puts important timetables on how long uh, the institution has to respond. An initial response is expected within seven days and a full response within 28 days from the date of the notice. Uh, and then if you turn across to Rule 10 at this point, um, you'll see the power to compel the giving of evidence where, for example, an institution refused to comply. Uh, however, we have engaged with the main institutions who have confirmed that they expect to be able to meet the time limits. Uh, rule 9 means that if the board wants further information from an applicant or their solicitor, uh, they need to give an initial period of at least 21 days and then send a reminder and give a further period of 14 days. That's for information that they want from applicants themselves. Rules 11, 12 and 13, uh, if I deal with them together, uh, they give people 21 days to decide if they want to accept an award or appeal it. Uh, though if there were a particular reason why they haven't been able to confirm that within that 21 period, uh, Rule 20, towards the back of the set of rules, does allow the board to consider extending the time. In fact, there, there is a general power for the board there to extend time periods in the rules. Uh, the award is paid by BACS transfer. 
Uh, and Rule 13 also reflects the discretion of the Board, uh, which is a discretion it has under the Act to make an initial payment of £10,000 in circumstances where it is satisfied that someone qualifies for a payment but hasn't yet decided on the full quantum. Uh, rules 14 to 17 uh, and the schedule at the, the very back of the rules are about the legal advice and assistance of which applicants are encouraged to avail. The <coughs> Hart report, uh, recognising that claims for redress raised difficult issues, said that in order for uh, them to pursue their claims effectively, victims and survivors should be provided with legal advice and assistance, including in presenting the necessary evidence to the board. We want to make sure that an app, what an applicant has experienced is expressed fully to the board so that they can get fair redress. Now, in setting payment rates for legal input, there have been two considerations uppermost in our minds. Uh, first, they need to be adequate so that victims and survivors don't have to pay for advice. Uh, Hart himself dealt with that point when he recommended tying them into county court scales for successful applications, which we've done. But they also need strong cost controls, and we want to discourage solicitors from submitting applications that simply don't meet the criteria. The normal route, as I've said, is for applications to be considered on the papers, uh, and Table 1 on page 11 of the rules sets out the scale of rates, which range from £298 for a solicitor, where £10,000 is awarded in compensation, uh, to £911, where the award is from £55,000 to £80,000. Uh, those are the, the core rates. But if I could take you back to the top of page 8, um, you'll see that if a written application is unsuccessful, the solicitor is entitled to the sum of £150 only. And this was calculated based on two and a half hours at the green form rate. But you'll also see at the top of page 8, uh, in the, the third line of text, that there is an important additional safeguard. Uh, the board has discretion to disallow even that £150 if an application is wholly without merit. That would give the board a means of dealing with a situation where, for example, repeated unmeritorious applications were coming from a single source. The 2019 Act, under which the, the rules are made, provides that oral hearings should be held where the panel considers that there are exceptional circumstances which make it necessary to hold one in the interests of justice. And that's an important rider to the scales in Table 2 at the back for oral hearings. Those are again based on the county court scale costs. So, for example, an application which led to an award of £40,000 and which in exceptional circumstances had required an oral hearing would attract solicitors' costs of £5,800. Uh, rule 18 uh, provides that in the exceptional circumstances of an oral hearing, the expenses of any witnesses can be covered. Uh, and finally, Rule 21 means that if there is a mistake somewhere in the procedures, an applicant will still get the award that they're entitled to. Happy, Chair, to take any questions. Are you happy to, happy that we move to okay. questions, Chair? Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, for, for um, the presentation. Um, obviously, there are quite a number of rules and quite a number of guidelines and quite a number of um, quite a lot of detail that's in that. And I suppose the concern just from the Chair's position here is that um, once the rule has been laid, it, it can't be amended. Obviously, we either have to just give support or not. Um, this is a very um, emotive issue and one that has been hanging around for quite a considerable amount of time, and people are looking for conclusion on it. Um, and I, I, I can't help feeling that the process has left us as a committee quite boxed in, that it's here, 
we either agree to it or not. If we don't agree to it, it's going to cause a delay, uh, and yet there's quite a substantial amount of detail there. Um, you know, the, the committee should have time for proper scrutiny of it. So what, what would be the solution um, in a scenario like this? Well, I think, Chair, to give you some uh, reassurance in terms of how these have been worked through, we are working to a very tight uh, time frame. Uh, it has been very tight uh, in order to try and get the amendments in place as soon as possible. Um, these rules have been developed and have been discussed with the victims and survivors groups. They have been gone through in detail by uh, Justice Colton, who is the, the president of the board, who is a judge well used in these sorts of areas, gone through the rules in very considerable detail uh, to ensure that they, they actually give effect to what is set out under the Act. Uh, and, and in so doing, he has also met with victims and survivors to talk to them about any of their concerns and to ensure that they would be reflected in the rules. And I think the further safeguard that there is around us is that the rules have to be uh, approved and have been approved by the Lord Chief Justice, who has who has who has uh, looked through them. So I think those are a, a range of ways in which uh, the committee can take uh, comfort from the extent of scrutiny that there has already been, uh, and, and the extent of engagement that there has been in bringing the rules forward. We would again emphasise that the the rules only can give effect to what's already in the Act. Uh, they can't go beyond that, uh, and that's what they're trying to do, to set out the detail of the process. If there is something that emerged later on down the track that was causing a problem, the rules can also be amended. So uh, while, while this committee only has a yay or nay uh, on, in terms of the actual uh, rules themselves as a whole, there is the potential for if, if something significant emerged for us to bring the rules back and say we need to make some sort of an amendment. Do you want to say add anything to that, Gareth? Yes, yes, and that can be done by negative resolution reasonably straightforwardly. Again, I, uh, this isn't directed at the department because I know that the time scales move forward, but it seems that everybody that has a part of this process has had significant time to examine the rules and to have their input except us, um, and that's most unfortunate. But I think it's process rather than individuals that have done that. But um, just I don't think it's fair that the committee that has a yay or an A that could have ironed stuff out if we had had it a little bit of time before. But I do appreciate that we're up against the clock on this and that that leaves us in a different perspective. Because, for example, maybe, um, Gareth, this question could be more directed to yourself. <coughs> are you satisfied that all individuals or the majority of individuals that will be impacted this had a a good and proper and full opportunity to participate uh, in consultation and, and had an opportunity to have the rules detailed to them and explained to them and, and their views sought in that? Are, are, you, are you confident that, that the majority of, of people out there have, have been afforded that opportunity? Well, as I say, on the earlier draft of them, which we put out with the, uh, the policy and, and legislation, um, that was a, a Public consultation that was widely circ uh, that was widely circulated. Um, we then, after the president was uh, appointed, worked with him and with the shadow redress board on the the detail um, and filled out a fair amount of detail of the rules. Uh, and then, working through the uh, uh, interim advocate and the victims and survivors groups, I, I gave a presentation. Um, I have to say that the um, uh, well. One um, specific point that was made uh, there, which was welcomed, was about arrangements for certifying documents um, that were not requiring people to go to the General Register Office for certified copies of birth certificates and marriage certificates. The solicitor who is helping you with the application can, can do the certification. Uh, that was welcomed. But, but aside from that, really the things we discussed were much wider issues than the, the rules um, about how people might make applications in, in various circumstances, um, about uh, some of the, the wider policy issues and, and the justification for them. So we weren't getting an awful lot of feedback on the procedural details of the rules themselves. But you're satisfied that the majority of those that are fall within the remit of, of this had an opportunity to participate and did, or do you feel that there was anything lacking in that front? Um, well, you could probably always say that you could uh, you could do more, but as I say, there was a there was a public consultation. Um, there was then a more targeted one with uh, the groups. Um, so yes, we're satisfied that we have consulted people. Okay, 
Okay. Before I move on to Mike, um, can I just say we've had um, Hansard are recording this from another place, but they're concerned that there's a lot of interference from a mobile. So maybe if I could just ask if people do have mobiles, if they could put them onto silent and um, maybe just uh, for whatever reason, and, and they're obviously trying to capture this remotely. So um, if people could do that and, and pass to yourself, Mike. Chair, thank you very much. And, and Gareth and Mark, thank you for your presentations. I, I am, first of all, going to say I don't accept that you're up against a tight time frame. And the reason for that is some of us sat in this room, I think, in 2013, which is seven years ago, um, discussing the establishment of the Institutional Abuse Inquiry. And so, to my mind, it has been clear for over seven years that this piece of legislation would be required. So I'm just putting that on the record. To what extent has this been co-designed with victims and survivors? Can I pick that up, Gareth, because you were involved in the detail of that? Um, yes, yes. Um, the the co-design with victims and survivors um, hasn't focused so much on these uh, rules um, because they are technical, they are legal, um, and we've had, had legal specialists working on them. Um, but there has been an important um, co-design process that has been running with victims and survivors um, through the earlier part of, of this year that's been facilitated by the interim advocate and his office uh, and has involved the Shadow Redress Board and ourselves. Um, so, for example, um, there has been uh, a demonstration of the uh, online application system that solicitors would use uh, and that we're going to uh, open up uh, very shortly for victims and survivors to use themselves. Um, people were taken through the application form and uh, made some suggestions about it uh, and that was a very helpful session. Um, there have been discussions about um, process, there have been discussions about, about support, so um, that has been the co-design process about the kind of practical things that victims and survivors are going to encounter rather than the, the technical, different, uh, technical details of the rules. What impact, Gareth, if any, has the breakdown of relations between the interim advocate and Savia had? Savia, of course, claiming to be the biggest of the victims' groups. Yeah, yes. Um, the interim advocate uh, has, con uh, and the, the issue has been about face to face contact. Um, the interim advocate has been continuing to circulate information to Savia uh, and to give them the opportunity to contribute in that way. Uh, we do recognise that that's not a satisfactory situation. Uh, we've been exploring with the interim advocate's office uh, and with Savia if an alternative arrangement could be put in place. Um, and we're just finalising some thinking on that with a view to going back uh, to Savia with a proposal. As you say, these, these are technical rules and, and they follow broader precedents. Um, would, would you say it would be difficult for a victim without reasonably significant legal experience to approach compensation without legal aid, without the assistance of a lawyer? Um, we would certainly want to encourage people to use solicitors. Um, I think uh, that was the hard recommendation, um, and uh, a solicitor will help people well, hear someone's story uh, and will help to condense it down into a format that the, the board can best deal with. Uh, and the board will be engaging with solicitors about what format of statement is most useful to it. Um, at the same time, uh, we recognise that uh, not everybody will want to go through a solicitor um, and uh, obviously the, the, there will need to be routes in for uh, people who, who don't. Um, but the message in heart uh, was very much encouraging people to avail of that service. Now, at point four, you, you defined six pieces of supporting material that an applicant would need to bring, but you did say, I think, in your opening remarks that there was a flexibility to uh, the board. Is, is, that, can I just, is that covered at point four two three? Am I reading that correctly? Uh, the, uh, yeah. Now, I should just say that 
uh, not all six of those are required for every applicant. Um, so in the typical situation, um, you will just need uh, your birth certificate, a form of photographic identity, uh, and then any medical reports or further information that you want to submit with your, your application. Um, some of those other things are if you've changed your name, uh, if you uh, someone who, who doesn't have full mental capacity and has a controllership arrangement, um, those kind of situations um, which may be less common. Uh, and the provision is at uh, four three. Uh, if it's not possible for the application to be supported by the material referred to, uh, the application must be supported by alternative evidence of the identity of the applicant or, or deceased. So right. that gives the opportunity to bring forward alternative So if, for example, a victim doesn't have a form of photo ID that would be suitable for the Chief Electoral Officer, <coughs> an alternative form of ID may be? Exactly, exactly. As I understand it, the, the, the data collected by Sir Anthony in the Institutional Abuse Inquiry was locked down. Has that, has that now been transferred, or is it open to being transferred? Yes, that, that's open to being transferred. Uh, the, the order, the lockdown order, the restriction order, uh, allowed any future redress board to be able to access the, uh, the information. Uh, and there has been an extensive piece of work done in conjunction with PRONI uh, to get that indexed. Um, so uh, a lot of progress has been made on indexing it, particularly for uh, older people um, whose applications are going to be treated with, with priority. Um, and uh, there's also been some progress made in, in, in digitising it. So uh, arrangements uh, were being put in place for that to be supplied securely to them. And to, and to finish, if I may, just two, two quick, hopefully quickly answered questions on, on costs. The legal costs, you've got a schedule uh, on page 11. Any concerns that um, solicitors and barristers would not consider this to be value for money, or that it would be in any way off-putting and engaging in this process on behalf of victims? Um, the fact that we were going to use the uh, county court scale costs uh, and a reference to the tables now, they, they have been expanded since uh, up to £80,000, but the, uh, the fact that we were going to use those tables was included in the consultation uh, last year, um, so people would have been aware. Uh, I know the, the Law Society is aware. Um, any anecdotal comments I've heard, um, certainly solicitors aren't regarding it as a, a money spinner, uh, but there hasn't been there haven't been any red lights expressed to us about the rates. Okay. And finally, and I know this could be considered very minor in the great scheme of things, but at 161A, uh, under travel expenses for solicitors and counsel, uh, you say if the relevant distance is at least 20 miles, but not more than 50 miles, there will be a payment of £23. That's just a one-off set payment. Yes. But if it's 20 miles, that's £1.15 a mile. Uh, that is only for circumstances. Uh, now, I, I think I'm right that those have been based on, on rates that are used elsewhere, but uh, that is only in circumstances where there is an oral hearing, uh, which under the legislation would be exceptional circumstances. Um, so we're, we're not anticipating th those rates to be very much. Yes, it's a, a, a pound a mile, but the, the flip side is if you have to come uh, 100 miles, uh, you're only getting £46, pounds, so there is a, a swings and roundabouts aspect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Christopher? Thank you very much. Um, I think, just to start, I think it is the shared view of this committee that what we want at the end of this is that uh, victims get through this process cleanly and as quickly as possible with the minimum of stress. Has any group or individual raised concerns that that which is outlined here may cause them additional stress? Has anyone raised any, cons any concerns that you foresee in three or four months' time, if we have victims' groups in with us, that they will raise in what is in their time? I think we can't, can't give a... Uh Affirmation that no one either haven't had some sort of an issue or, or, or a difficulty with some part of the process. Uh, 
the nature of the of the group that we are dealing with uh, um, uh, and who, who, who will come forward. I mean, that some of them may struggle with these kind of, yeah. of bureaucratic type processes, which is why indeed the recommendation of Hart was that they should be supported through this, through a solicitor and why the provisions are there to provide that support the whole way through. And the work that Gareth described in terms of both the consultation and then the engagement afterwards with the victims groups um, was to try and ensure as far as possible the process is as simple as it can be. But the underworkings of a process sometimes have to be more complicated and that's what we're looking at today. These rules are the underworkings, they're not what will appear to to those that, that, that are making the application. What they will see is the actual form, the questions that are required, the broad statements that are required. This is the, 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 the stuff to guide the redress board and to guide the mechanics in behind the rally, actually see. So we have engaged uh, on, uh, uh, with victim with survivors on this. We have tried to take into account the comments that they, ha that, that they have made. We've engaged with the interim advocate uh, and, and we are hopeful that the process that we have come up with and, and as Gareth said, the victims have seen the, um, a run through of, of the, the, the application uh, uh, process and uh, have, were engaged in, in the forum. So hopefully it is simple enough uh, for, for everyone to, to, to understand or where that's difficult for them to be guided appropriately by solicitors. I'm just wondering, could you talk me through then step by step Someone comes forward talking under. I appreciate this is the, the stuff that's under the bonnet. This is the, the mechanics. Just step by step, the process that someone yep. will go through if they're making a claim. Yep. I like Gareth, do yep. that because yep. he's been more closely involved in the, in the precise detail. Yes. Um, someone who wants to make a claim would uh, approach their solicitor or approach uh, any solicitor um, and would talk through with the solicitor. Uh, what it is that happened to them uh, and talk through their experiences. Um, if they have any uh, relevant evidence, if they have medical reports already or specialist reports already, uh, they would bring those uh, and they would bring their identification uh, documents um, to the solicitor as well. Uh, the solicitor will then go on to uh, an online system uh, which is developed and, and, and ready to <coughs> run uh, and that will be through, uh, they'll access that through their, their LAMS account which uh, most listers I think have in this area but, but others can, can get access if they need to. Um, the uh, application process, the, the online system um, will, will guide the solicitor through the necessary information for that particular applicant. So, for example, if someone went to and gave evidence to the uh, HIA inquiry and are happy for that information to be used by the redress board and don't want to supplement it, it's actually a very straightforward mm. input process for the uh, for the solicitor. It's just attach the identity documents, fill in a few basic details and, uh, and away the application goes. Um, now, uh, it may be that the solicitor uh, in a more serious case, and, and the, the redress board will be saying that medical reports um, are, are really just needed in the more serious cases. It may be that the solicitor wants the, application, the applicant to go and get a medical report uh, or to, to go and see a specialist and, and get a report from them that would be submitted to the, the redress board. So that would be part of the um, process if it were relevant uh, uh, as well. Um, but, but basically completed, from the okay, So completed application then lands with the redress board. How is that considered? Yeah. Um, the application goes through um, electronically. Um, the redress board staff will, will check to make sure that, that everything is there as appropriate uh, and that will then be put in front of a three-person panel. Uh, the panel will be chaired by a county court judge and will have two senior health and social care figures uh, as members um, and it will be up to the panel then to, to make the decision. Now the board does intend to uh, provide panels uh, and indeed to, to publish um, an indication of uh, the, the, the
kind of issues, uh, well, a, a banding uh, indication, really, uh, of the different bands of awards and the kind of issues that would bring an application into each of those bands. Okay. And um, uh, just uh, 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 when I hear three member panel, it uh, just uh, puts me in mind of the PIP process. There's no point at this in this process where a victim is in front of a panel. Uh, that would be very much an exceptional circumstance. So, uh, under normal cases, uh, the application will be considered um, on the, the basis of the written evidence. It would be if the panel felt that it needed more information or needed to um, explore a particular issue in exceptional circumstances. In the interests of justice, it could order an oral hearing. Um, but in those circumstances, uh, an applicant would be able to be accompanied both by their solicitor and by a companion. Just I know that any of us who have had to accompany people to those PIP hearings have found just how brutal that process can be on people. Um, uh, we, we've, we've, we've kind of we've had two points of view. Um, some people would really like to have their day in court, and that's yes. understandable. Um, some people. Uh, never want to appear in front of anything that, that looks legal again uh, and so the exceptional circumstances has been trying to, to reach a compromise there and just to be clear then so that rule number 10 yeah. um it there's no so there is a process is there a prospect of rule number 10 applying to an applicant in terms of a compulsion to appear uh really the policy intention there was about uh institutions, if an institution was failing to provide information, um, that there would be uh, the power to, to compel the giving of evidence. Now, if there needs to be an oral hearing, uh, an applicant will get a notice that says, this is where you mm. need to be and, and, and when. Um, but uh, I say that the main policy intention there was about institutions. And in terms of that process, would it be possible I see you say they're a legal representative or another, just by the standing, people are going to have to be asked to detail all these things that happened to them, and maybe also like having to be counselors or something like that on hand to assist people through the process. Yeah. Um, in term, sorry, well, Chair. Yeah, I'm going to get a comment. Just We've just been told again that there's terrible interference with our system and that there are some members of the press trying to cover it and, and they're unable to because of the interference. I know your phone has been buzzing and buzzing and buzzing, that one over there, but there'd be any way of putting them onto uh, airplane turn mode? It off. Um, because there may be just, for whatever way the system is laid today, it must be no, no, uh, even bad. just by sorry, normal stuff. Off. Um, and we'll see if I that thought if I moved it away from the mic, though. Uh, it so. seems to be, but it must be something within the room that it's it's not getting picked up. So okay. it could be a fault with the system, but it might be if we just sorry. And and we'll revert back to yourself then. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, Claire, it's off now. Um, so, in terms of. That rule 10, that relates to institutions and being compelled. Have we, I mean, I, maybe there, is there any outline or schedule of penalties for institutions or individuals who refuse to comply? Uh, let me just refer to the Act. Um, uh, yes. Uh, in the Act itself, uh, section 10, subsection 7, a person commits an offence if the person fails to comply with the requirement of a notice under this section, and uh, subsection 8, commits an offence if the person conceals, destroys, distorts, or alters, or arranges for the concealment, destruction, distortion, or alteration uh, of anything required or which there are reasonable grounds for believing might be required. Um, and a person who is guilty of an offence under those subsections is liable on summary conviction to imprisonment for a term not exceeding six months or a fine not exceeding level three on the standard scale. Well, that's fair enough. Um, then just a final point. For some people, I think a signposting service would be useful in terms of getting access to legal representation. You know yourself that there are solicitors and law firms that have 
specialisms, and you also know that this is a community of individuals. It's, it's a group of individuals, but they're also, in, in a very real sense, a community. So you might end up with one or two solicitor's offices taking on a lot of this work and specialising in it. If people who are not your victims but are not necessarily part of the community in that broad sense who have been through this process, if they were, if there was a signposting service available for them, you know, look, it's not your job, I know, to put uh, business in the direction of solicitors, but to suggest, look, here's a list of solicitors that we know who are dealing with other people, I think that would be helpful and useful for people. Um, it's difficult to do it in that way because it means we're favouring mm. particular solicitors. Uh, what we can do uh, and what the Interim Advocates Office will do is direct people to the Law Society. We're on their website. You can narrow it down yes. to personal injuries. You can narrow it down to your locality and you can get the people who, who deal with that. In practice, I suspect um, the solicitors who uh, have been dealing with a lot of these cases yeah. will, will have their own publicity. Um, um, and uh, be, be advertising about their availability for other victims and survivors. Just finally to say, I actually am quite glad that, we've <laughs> that we are seeing this. I would have liked a bit more notice, but I think it's really good that we're actually cracking on and getting this done. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, Martina? Um, I, I'd probably um, start off on that note that Christopher left off, because some people might be wondering why in the middle of this pandemic that we're all sitting here around this table uh, and talking about uh, the subject matter, but the issue of historical his institutional abuse is crucially important and we all want to see it move forward. I think that I acknowledge, given the, the time that we're in it, that in slower time, we would have preferred to be able to be involved in the kind of scrutiny that I say from my, my understanding of the, the personnel that I know in this committee will be how we will go forward. Um, it will never go back to would have, should have, could have. And the criticism that was given out to, uh, to MLAs in the past for not doing the job as, as was seen uh, properly, uh, that we should have been involved in the scrutiny that uh, was required and demanded by society. And we will do that in the time ahead. But we're dealing with the crisis that we're dealing with. We're dealing with um, a global pandemic, and I think just it would be remiss for, for us not to mention that from in a 24-hour period that 2,500 people died uh, from, from yesterday to today um, are across the world uh, of coronavirus. And therefore, I just want to say this is not the matter that we're dealing with. But uh, for those that are out there in construction firms and anywhere else that have workers coming in that aren't essential services, need to give their heads a shake and, and protect uh, their employees uh, and enable them to go home uh, protected and to protect their family. I would say that in relation to uh, this, that I accept sometimes, Gareth, that rules like this, uh, statutory rules, can be viewed as technical. But given the conversation I've just had around uh, coronavirus, I would say that every one of our, us as MLAs, uh, hopefully, God willing, we'll all come through this, um, will probably come out of this experts in, in benefit advice and some kind of advice because of the volume of people we're trying to deal with and hopefully we're able to respond to them. Because I don't regard this as technical, I regard it as practical. And it's the practical understanding of the of the law, because when you're saying to people, well, the applicant, the applications have to be done in writing. These are things that people need to know. Supportive material. What is it is required? Uh, I have to say that the power to compel, the compelability. I'm glad to hear that. Glad to see that in it, and hopefully that that will uh, will result in any perhaps any any organisation that would be uh, approached. Uh, demand the material and, and sources that uh, that they don't hide behind the fact that uh, that they they won't be coming forward. But anyway, the appeal mechanism, the payment, the travel expenses—these are all practical things that the victims will will want to know. So um, perhaps some kind of uh, information sheet to be given out to victims and, and disturbed uh, to hear that the relationship 
um, isn't as good with some of the victim groups and others. I know that I have worked quite closely with all of them in many ways in, my, in the past as, as the, the junior minister responsible for, uh, for making the recommendation that this inquiry takes place um, as one of them. But um, I, I've worked very closely, for instance, with John McCourt in the North West, and uh, I know that as victims that they are running out of patience. And they've been trying to resolve this for 50 or 60 years. It's not something that this executive has been dealing with for over that period of, li of that lifetime, but they have, a, they, they have inherited uh, this. And uh, I'm glad to see that we are at this point where we are today. So in terms of the uh, certification that you talk about, Garth, I'm assuming that we're also corona proofing some of the stuff now. Because how do you have victims um, sitting down with solicitors? Of course, that can't happen. They can do it over the phone. But given what has happened to a lot of these victims and some of them struggling in the manner that they are and in terms of even employment, even having access to the kind of technology that might be required, have you over the last, I know it's only been recent, in recent weeks, but corona proofed this so that some of the the processes that have to take place around the involvement of the solicitors, and perhaps it not always been possible for that face-to-face -face interaction taking place. Is that been a factor that has been considered as we take this forward? Well, maybe I'll make a few comments on that, and Gareth can fill in if I, if I leave some bits out. <clears throat> and what we've been trying to do on this is, as far as possible, um, to have the system from the outset user friendly for victims and, and survivors, make sure they get the support that they actually need, but also to have it online as far as possible because that helps with the management of all the material, it helps with the efficiency, and it helps with uh, costs. So um, we have been working on an IT system that will be capable of taking bundled documents, putting them together, and being able to get them out to the address board who can potentially work virtually. It doesn't necessarily always have to be in the one room. But we they have access to all the uh, materials. So we have, we, we, have, we, have, we have set out the system in that way to try and make sure as far as possible it can be done remotely. There are some um, restrictions on that. Um, uh, we can have options around an online form, and we're working in detail on that. The system for going in through a solicitor that, that Gareth has talked about is there and is ready to go. Um, there's a potential for downloading a form, being in a paper form. The difficulty with that is that um, it creates administrative overheads mm -hmm. and creates other, 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 other problems. Um, so we've tried to keep it as, as online as possible, but mindful of the fact that not everybody will be able to access online and mindful of the fact that they are best guided by solicitors and mindful of the fact that this can be re-traumatizing, as I think someone mentioned earlier on, and the necessary support needs to be there. Now, the recent developments in coronavirus have made some of those things very, very difficult, as you can think, yeah. just as I've yeah. gone through that. Yeah. Because then you, and you've made the very point yourself about access to solicitors. Maybe some things can be done over the phone, maybe some things can be, can be emailed in, but there may be some cases where that, the, the access isn't there. And that's, that's something that we're looking at at the moment, because the advice, as you know, is changing day by day and things are tightening day by day. So we, if you say have we coronavirus proofed this, we have been aware of what the developments are and we've been trying to take in those into account as best we can. But the advice on the, the virus, frankly, is moving quicker than, mm. than, than all of us at this point. Um, but we've tried to take it into account as much as we can. We've tried to make sure as much as possible is online. But there's no doubt that some of the restrictions that are in are going to have an impact on the capacity to uh, ensure a flow of information. In because information, for example, has to come from Prony, um, and while some of that has been digitised and a lot of it's been indexed, that work isn't complete. And the 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 instruction to staff at the minute is to stay at home uh, unless their work is essential. So there's issues there about protection of staff and about that flow of information. There's also the potential here for GP record to be accessed. Well, I don't think at the moment we want to put in additional uh, demands on GPs. Um, there can be additional, in certain circumstances, and they would be rare, but it's a certain circumstance for additional assessments to be required again. That's going to be difficult in, in, in the current processes. And as I said, uh, and as you have mentioned, solicitors' practice aren't all fully operational at the moment. So there are huge challenges uh, around us at, in, that, in, in, in the current position. So we're trying to see what, what and we're considering, we'll be talking with ministers about what is possible. Uh, um, in terms of, of, of um, constraints, um, to be 
do recognize how important it is for victims and survivors, um, we do recognize the time to take them out of the country, also mindful of the need to protect with them, uh, protect with them, maybe provide supporting them for the person. Can I ask you then, in terms of um, the statutory rule that goes through the Assembly in the context of everything you've said, uh, even the solicitors, obviously the protection of the staff and making sure that people are working from home, there's nothing that we're going to do in in the process of agreeing with the stat these statutory rules that it would result in inhibiting um, what you have outlined now that would need to be taken into account in the event of, as you say, the spread of this virus and we're told um, what's going to happen over the next uh, two weeks can be, a, it's going to be very difficult for us as a society and people in general. So I'm just concerned that, that, that there's, I want to know, I want to be satisfied, there's nothing that we're doing here that cannot deal with the implications of the worst case scenario with regards to what may happen with coronavirus, with staff maybe not being able to be accessible, working away, with the victims not having access to solicitors, going to the GPs because we don't want to overload the GPs, not being able to do face-to-face -face meetings, you know, nothing that we're doing here that's going that can't be altered or amended to deal with the crisis that's unfolding. Well, I think there's two. There's there are at least two aspects, and there's probably more. Um, the first one is is the question: you know, Is there anything that we actually got in the rules here that might be an impediment? And we think there's flexibility that's been built. And Gareth referred to earlier 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 on to to accept different forms. Of the second thing is that, is, is that, of course, these rules reflect the legislation. So some aspects of the rules have to be here or other mm -hmm. to give effect to the yeah. legislation. So there's not a flexibility that can be given, but where there is a, a, the capability of flexibility, some of that has, has been built in. But I think the broader question you're asking me is really a very difficult one for me to answer, because if you're asking me from, from start to finish, the whole process, step by step, is all of that capable of being delivered in full in the current conditions, I'd have to say no, it's not. I don't think I can't think of any service at the moment that's capable of being delivered absolutely in current circumstances. And what we're looking at at the minute is is um, just what the implications are of 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 the ever tightening and the ever developing advice on the actual process and mechanism. Well, but I do think if that is the case, then we need to be forecasting what that might look like in a worst case scenario, because victims and survivors need to know what may or may not unfold with regards to the time frames that they are all clutching onto and hoping by the end of this month, uh, in March, that the applications will open, that the redress board will be set up. If there's any indication, and I'm sort of hearing from you, that there may be difficulties in the time ahead because of A, the unknown of the extent of what may be coming at us, and B, the implications of, of all of that. So I think it's it's important that uh, the victims and survivors are the first people that we interact with and engage with because we don't want to be going through process based and telling them, well, in a technical way or a practical way, this is a process that you may have to go through, but by the way, because of what we're dealing with, then it's not that anyone is kicking a can down the road, but the implications of that is, is, uh, is going to impact on the time frame for this? Yep, I, I, I agree with what, you, what you've said. Well, what we've been doing is trying to get all the mechanisms in place to have them, as I say, digitised as far as possible, because that is a protection. Uh, but not all parts of the process can be entirely digitised. Mm -hmm. And we've been looking over the last day or so, just with the, with the revised advice, particularly over, over, over the weekend, what are the implications for the process from end to end and potential ways of dealing with that. Uh, and we haven't yet reached a conclusion on that. We want to discuss with ministers. Uh, on that, and we'll also want to discuss with with groups uh, around that. Um, but I mean, I think I think um, even a short consideration of what is happening at the moment uh, would enable anyone to conclude that there's going to be some impact on the process. The question is the extent of that process and on, on what is manageable here. And what is that impact? I think in terms of. may or may not happen. And so they know that we as 
the scrutiny and the process and making sure that uh, we, we minimize any impact insofar as we can. And that's where it may be helpful in the time ahead for this to be interrogated and for some information to be relayed to us as to what possibly may happen. Because we're able to forecast in a worst case scenario. We've been told by different ministers in a worst case scenario what is the, um, the possible outcome of the number of people who may die uh, in, in society as a consequence of coronavirus. And, you know, if we don't keep our physical distance, that's why we're all uh, hopefully sitting far enough apart <laughs> today and that Christopher doesn't sneeze <laughs> or anything like that. No. Yeah, so we're just, you know, we're hoping that, that we're doing everything, that we're trying to protect the people who work in this building. We're trying to keep ourselves. Uh, we need to demonstrate to people that uh, there's no point in saying to people, well, you cannot, uh, if you don't keep a physical distance and do social distancing, you will be the person who can result in someone dying. You can kill people with this if, you, if you're reckless. So we all know that, but we want to be able to go to the victims and survivors who will be watching this and going, but what does that mean for us? So that's the kind of uh, perhaps understanding, Garth, that it might be, even if it's after this meeting, with some kind of explanatory note sent around to us as, as, as MLAs so that we can relay that information because uh, we are, like yourselves and like others, we are the people, the victims and survivors and others are coming to for the, for the advice and guidance support and to be their voice uh, through these difficult, turbulent times. I think that's very helpful. Uh, we, we are looking at this at the moment. We need to discuss with ministers just what the handling plan is and every, every, uh, everything. Yeah. And we want to also discuss with victims and survivors groups, as you, as, as you mentioned. But it is a moving situation. Yeah. Could I ask just you know about the re just one more question around the redress board? And it was an issue we were dealing with last week, uh, particularly um, the, com the compensation and the upper limit of eighty thousand that had been set and the cap. And then when we had the interim advocate uh, response to that, that that was too low. Obviously, the victims and survivors uh, that I have spoke to do not want to see a process delayed, um, although they would like to see the uplift happening. If in the if the redress board is making, um, can they make a compensation that is above the 80,000, and whilst in the first instance, um, if they can get the 80,000 until such time as the, hopefully the uplift procedures, the legislation or whatever needs to be, that we discussed yesterday or last week, needs to be brought forward in order for that to happen. Would it, would it need in the first instance that the redress board makes that declaration when they are saying to the victim about the payment and the compensation at that point? Or is the, are they having to go through another process if there is an uplift so that such an uplift would be considered? The situation is that the rules and the, the, um, the actual um, scale has to be absolutely clear and agreed in order to take its work. That's the parameters within which the redress board has to actually act, actually operate. Um, so that has to be decided beforehand. And currently, currently the, the the cap is what it is. Um, and the interim advocate wrote recently to say that spoken with all the, all of the groups, um, they, they they didn't want to proceed with the change around the cap because of the potential impact on time scales and and all the, all the the, re the rest of it. But it it wouldn't be possible at a later date. Would it wouldn't it not be possible because the, the redress board has to make their own basis of the scale that has been agreed uh, and set. That, that affects not potentially the cap. be low because in practice many of these are going to be relative. So if you raise the cap, possibility is that you raise potentially all other um, relative um, considerations below that. So it's not just a matter of some cases at the top end, but. Um, so, so that, that has been withdrawn in terms of a, a request. Uh, Just over the last few days? The advocate wrote. Uh, yes, uh, I think he wrote to the over, chair, I think. Over yeah. a week ago, I think. Yeah, yeah but we, we yeah. had we had, sure we had the advice last week, um, the legal advice. We dealt with that last yeah. week, and it wasn't in the context of, well, this wasn't going to happen. Sure, we wouldn't have sat through an off-camera meeting getting legal advice on 
on this matter. My, my, under, my understanding was that they, um, there was a request that the potential to increase the threshold was requested, then we investigated it, and then the groups have come back to say that they didn't want that upper limit. So the two kind of ran alongside each other, us trying to find out could it be less, um, increased mm -hmm. alongside the same time that the, at, at the end of that process they came back to say that they didn't want the, the increase because they don't want the delay. Yeah. Um, if I could add to that, Chair, there, there has been over quite a period, Martina, kind of informal mm -hmm. gathering of reps of the main parties, including mm -hmm. the Greens, so mm -hmm. six parties. Mm -hmm. um, and as I understand it, everybody was content to accept that the groups now do not want the potential delay or disruption. No, well, no, I knew that. So we, we stick with. No, I, th I thought that. I mean, in terms of my understanding, they didn't want any delay. They didn't want any disruption. But if, through the legal advice that we got last week, that this could happen, um, that's and that retrospectively, it could be, it, it could, it could apply. Then, whilst they don't want any delay for now, they don't want anything that's going to um, in any way interfere with this process. But it's certainly something that they wouldn't want just taken off the table if it could be retrospectively applied. And I thought by the legal advice we had last last week that it was told we were told that that, that could happen. Uh, well, I haven't but seen, your, I haven't really seen your legal advice. I'm not aware okay. what your legal okay. advice is. Our understanding would be yeah. that. That, that the decisions are the decisions on the on offer, on I certainly don't want to do anything that's going to cause any is, delay because yeah. that's exactly well, I, yeah and I suppose maybe in the in the context of this conversation we don't need to have no. the other conversation okay. so maybe if we can yeah. conclude here we can come back to the other yeah. 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 and given that the legal advice was in private session that yeah. one element yeah, of the conversation yeah. would probably be we can do that later okay. oh. Okay, um, sorry, I was trying to read the advice there and, and we've concluded at the same time. So, um, gentlemen, that's the, the end of the, the, the questions to say um, a process that we don't want to see any delay in and, and I'm sure the committee will reach a, an appropriate decision um, after you leave and um, hopefully we can get the process and notwithstanding that, but I would suspect that we'll be inviting you back again in, in a period of time to find out how things have gone going, going on. And, and um, maybe looking at that point, I think maybe the impact of coronavirus on that process might be a subsection of some of the information that we'll be looking for. So I think it might be timely if you were preparing something under that, that, that heading for the next time that we get this uh, back again. So thank you very okay, much thank indeed. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, members then, um, I suppose then it is left to ourselves just to be either content or not content that the um, statutory rule is implemented. Um, I think maybe a sense that we're content. Yep. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, yes, but. <laughs> yes. Uh, we're going to call you Mr. Bud. <laughs> you had four buts yesterday. Uh, yes, that's, yep. that's number five. That's number five. Okay. Um, as I say, item five is Brexit, is the issues of the Brexit subcommittee, and I've already referred to the fact that you have a report and, and what we can do, but unfortunately we're not going to be taking that briefing today um, due to the uh, coronavirus and, and also uh, just that we have the written, uh, quite late, the written submission, and we can uh, work on that. Chair, if, if you don't mind, I understand why we're not doing it, but I think, as you said before we went into session, the two things we have to do are legislation and funding. Yeah. And um, there's a lot in this, I think there's 49 paragraphs, I think they're all open to question and clarification. But the one I want to draw members' attention to is number 18, which is EU funding. Because it seems the policy is in relation to EU funding, the executive's position is we require full replacement of the spending power we would have been able to access from the EU. So in other words, that's, we want the status quo. You could say, well, what? Why have we put ourselves through the last four years for the funding status quo? Should we not be more ambitious and wish to be better off? So I think that is one very important area where we need, as a committee, to take a view. I'm kind of conscious that we've said we're going to put the conversation back and have it at a point, but if there's a couple of headline issues, um, Martina, were you? Well, I mean, uh, <coughs> I think good luck with, uh, with the notion that we could be better off. Um, you know, we can't be having 3.5 billion pounds withdrawn from the EU 
So I can understand executive ministers not wanting to lose uh, that kind of funding. What we have been hearing from the, from the British Exchequer, there's no guarantee in how this is going to be applied across, um, particularly on Barnet consequences with, uh, for our farming industry and our, our rural development around uh, rural areas. But there are thousands and thousands of groups and organisations who have been so dependent on, on structural funds and have done sterling work across all of our uh, constituencies. So I can imagine that the, the executive would be trying to see if there are mechanisms to continue to draw down that degree of funding and also hooking in to research and development when we consider the importance it's going to be to our, for our universities, even trying to find a, a cure for this coronavirus and what they do. They're, they're world leaders, uh, University of Ulster and Queen's around cancer research and some of the work that they have been doing there. And then you have Erasmus Plus. Look, this is like peeling an onion and every layer brings its own layer of difficulty. So we're not going to, as you say, have the, the conversation in full today, but I would recommend when we do have the conversation that we allocate um, in that slower time a good and a good allocation of time because a full committee will have lots to say about the information that's come, that's come before us and what's not there even in the papers, but other information that we might get from civil service. Okay, and as I say, just the, the, the reason for not having that conversation today, uh, we've already discussed, and, and, and that it's, uh, but it is a conversation that we need to have, um, but it is one that certainly could take place in four weeks' time and, and, and would hopefully not have um, any uh, impact on the discussion that we would have, but it allows uh, departmental officials and ministers to be focusing in on what they need to focus in on at this stage. Members, item six is um, uh, an SL1, uh, a census order, Northern Ireland 2020. Um, information is in pages 19 to 123, so some light reading. Um, and it is really, um, the purpose is to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by the Census Act, Northern Ireland 1969. The Act makes a provision for taking from time to time of a census of the population and housing for otherwise collecting statistical information. Um, essentially what we have here is the Department of Finance will do the actual work, mm -hmm. uh, but it is the executive that actually instructs for that work to happen, so therefore that's why it's been led uh, via this uh, depart uh, committee as well. So um, in that case, just maybe to ask members, are they satisfied that we agree and note to that statutory rule? Okay. Yeah, and I think from, from our point of view, we were glad to see that some of the imperial language that was used in the last census has not been used in this because uh, whether people who come from um, Africa or Pakistan or whatever were, were very concerned about how they were being designated and described, so it's good that that's not longer that Kenga language isn't finding itself in the questions, the overview of the questions anyway, as I looked at them. Indeed, and also the inclusion of some uh, groups in society, society well that weren't, weren't recognised before, before as well as something before, that's yeah. welcome given that we're in 2020. Okay, um, item seven is the functioning of government, um, which is referred to page 123 of the meeting pack. Um, what we have here is essentially the um, bill. We had the presentation from the mem private member that's bringing forward the bill. The Committee of Finance is agreeing the proposals for handling the committee stage of that. Um, however, some of the provisions will fall under the responsibility of the Executive Office, so this committee will need to carry out its own scrutiny and report its findings back to the Finance Committee. In the first instance, though, the Committee for Finance will request written evidence on the clauses of the bill. So, Paragraph 4 um, sets out the groups and individuals that the Finance Committee will write to requesting that written information and then any written evidence that's received will be forwarded to ourselves for consideration. So essentially our task at this stage is on that list that is presented, are there any groups or individuals that we feel are omitted that we should be asking the Finance Committee to interact with? Looks pretty comprehensive to me. Okay. Um, I would have thought, is the Human Rights Commission not down there? Mind it is. Yeah. Yep. is it now? Okay. Okay. Oh, right. Sorry, I didn't see that. Is. 
So, um, and then if we can agree to consider the written evidence when it's received from the Finance Committee, and based on that evidence, we can identify groups at that stage that we may wish to consult with further, is something that's an opportunity yeah. for us. So, are members, members happy to note that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Then, um, item eight is just a report that has been prepared on the visit to Washington that took place two weeks ago, and just various groups that were met and some of the work that took place there and that might help us in the future. Members happy enough to note that? Yes, noted. Mm -hmm. Then item nine is the forward work programme, uh, which is on page 148 of the pack. Uh, just to let you know that next week's strategic planning meeting will not go ahead, um, and it has been rearranged whenever the committees and assembly are back to normal working order. Um, so our next meeting is actually scheduled to take place on the 22nd of April. Uh, it sounds quite a while away, but we next week would be the last week before the Easter recess, and then we're back the week after that, and that is when we will receive an oral briefing from officials on the budget position. Now, if anything changes in that time, committee staff will certainly let you know, but in terms of the committee forward work plan, are members happy to note? Yep. Yes. yep. Okay, then we'll fire on to correspondence, which is item 10. Page 152 of the meeting pack, there is correspondence from the Clerk of the Committee of Finance setting out the executive budget timetable and indicative, sorry, an indicative timetable for that. Now, the Committee of Finance is seeking the agreement of all statutory committees to participate in a standardised process for scrutiny of the executive budget for 2020-21. Uh, there is a raised briefing paper outlining the process at page 38 of the table pack that uh, members have today. So the standard out process involves issuing templates to the departments for completion to ensure that committees get the full, meaningful and timely information to facilitate the committee's scrutiny. So a copy of the template is at page 44, and that's what will be submit, uh, given to the department, and then they will complete that, submit it to ourselves, we will have time to consider it, and then whenever they come to give their oral briefing, we will have that standardised uh, report to be able to examine. So, if we're happy to participate in the process, members, if I could ask you to agree that we issue the template to the department and ask for the response well in advance of the 22nd of April meeting, and that we forward a copy of the, stand of the completed template when it is done to the Committee of Finance and to raise, and that we formally request that the department officials attend the committee on the 22nd of April to give the evidence. And I suppose that if uh, oral evidence isn't possible at that stage due to circumstances or ongoing circumstances that we would ask officials uh, to follow up any and within 24 hours any questions that we would raise at our meeting on the 22nd. So that would allow us to reach a determined position on the bill which can then be relayed the following week during the budget process. Again, the time frame I would just say if we're asking for the um, officials in the executive office to be in by the 22nd of April. We need to take account of what's going to happen over the next two weeks and maybe what will be happening to the staff, as had been outlined, who may be working away from home. And whether we will be meeting on the 22nd, of course, is something we will be looking at as we get closer to that time. So that may be something that needs to be taken into account that once we want it and we want all of this material well in advance, but we have to take account of what's going to happen over the next few weeks. Well, the beauty with facts and figures is it is something that can be worked with remotely, so okay. we would hope that it's information that can be pulled can together uh, in a lot uh, faster. But we'll certainly make sure that that's issued um, tomorrow, that that request goes down for that to be completed. Okay. Um, just under Chairman's business, just to update members that there was a meeting yesterday of the Chairperson's Liaison Group, and the key issue that we looked at was how we would meet as committees going forward. Um, what has taken place is, um, um, uh, from the meeting that was yesterday was that um, the, the, stand, the procedures committee will receive um, uh, instruction from the chairperson's liaison group to change the standing orders, which allows a change to how committees process and how they actually uh, take part. So, for example, there will, it will relax some of the... Um, potentially relax some of the rules around how we would vote on matters, how we would meet, what the quorum might be. What It, it won't change those things. It will allow for the change of those. Um, and the 
the chair or the um, officials at the chairpersons liaison group are going to bring back to that group next Tuesday a paper which then the chairpersons will all discuss because we feel that it's important that there's a standardised approach to how the committees um, meet. So, for example, and this isn't the the, the, the definitive case, there may be a decision taken that there's a platform that we could use electronically to meet, that we may be able to meet um, in some form of online portal and people could be at their individual homes and people that are officials may be able to give evidence via that as well. But if that was to be the case, the procedure committee Procedures Committee has to change the standing order and then the Chairperson's Liaison Group would have to take that decision. So that is going to hopefully happen within the next seven days. Just as a, as a general point in speaking, I suppose more <laughs> A Deputy Speaker of the Assembly rather than a DUP Assembly member. I, I do agree with the point that was made in the debate by uh, Jim Allister yesterday. Uh, government has just been voted enormous powers mm, yeah. and it is important that scrutiny functions exist. Mm -hmm. uh, even though we're in a serious situation, I also think it's important from a, a public perspective. If nurses and doctors are being asked to turn up at their post. I think assembly members should be prepared to, within the strict framework mm -hmm. in terms of preventing the spread of this disease, I understand that, but I think it's an important point in terms of the public looking out. This place was down for three years, and I think it would send a, a negative message if um, public sector workers have to be in their place of work and we abandoned ours. And I understand we're in very different, difficult times, but I just, just think that's important. So if you can keep us meeting insofar as possible, safely, then I think that should be the priority. On key issues. On key issues. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's a point. Like we, I think the more concerning thing that I had about the bill yesterday was that when we're taking civil liberties um, off people, then they have to be for that short, sharp period of when they are necessary because as we all know once civil liberties are taken from people then it's very hard to get them back for some people but good that it was across the board in that chamber that all of us felt deeply uncomfortable about uh, about taking in the emergency powers that are that are coming in and that said i think that uh, when we're meeting like this meeting couldn't have happened today if we hadn't been complying with the quorum as it had been mm -hmm. operating of old so I think we need to be looking at the prospects that people have been, and some of our committee members are self-isolating. So we've had to still comply with that quorum. So today, for instance, uh, even, I mean, I would have preferred that it hadn't been both Emma and I here um, because of just trying to also comply with the rule of physical distancing. And so I think we need to be able to do our job uh, I don't think any MLA is shy about coming into this place, but we have to, we're going to ask society and give out to people that are being reckless, not performing that function of physical distancing and social distancing, as it's called. I think social distancing is what friends and families and all that do. Physical distancing is what we have to do with colleagues and, and, and with society. And I'm also concerned for the staff around this building and the cleaners who are coming in here and having to come in and the regularity of all of that because they have to perform those functions as nearly business as usual. So I want to acknowledge the cleaners that are going about this building and the work that they are doing to try and ensure that, uh, that this place is, is as clean as it needs to be to allow us uh, to come into the building. But I think that because we're having to operate on to the quorum as it is of old, maybe when the procedure committee meets, then if the rule book is gone to the wall, then it needs to go, go to the wall. And if there are at times, if it becomes too dangerous for anyone to be in any place of work, then we need to be able to make that call. But we're not going home to sip our feet up. There's, there's a thing like we, we've been operating Discord. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. You can, you can bring about 50 people into a meeting it's been a great way of a party, even political parties, being able to bring people together and communicate. Now you can't; there's no visual of that. It's only it's only over the phone, but it's actually it's over your laptop or whatever. Or the phone is fine. I'd recommend it or that kind of apps that are that are helpful in the time ahead. So it's going to be a rolling mm -hmm. issue that we just need to deal with. Yeah, I would just echo. I mean, well, I don't disagree with what you're saying, and you know the, the idea that we're asking people who are literally saving lives to go to their work. 
that we would then say, but whilst we're here, the security guards, mm. the cleaning staff, the, the people in the canteen, they're all terrified. You're talking to them, and I just, if, if there's anything that we can cut that's unnecessary at this time, we need to practice what we're what we, what we preaching in terms of time. I think certainly the, the method that, that with the committee clerk and myself and, and put forward certainly to, to people, yes, I think I might mention it was like laws and money. If it's a law that's going to change or it's about a budget and about how money is going to be spent, to me, everything that's beyond that is not necessarily sure. urgent and, and could wait. But uh, this will be updated by the chairperson's um, liaison committee next week, so we'll have that joy uh, next Tuesday then, um, Emma, that we can, can go to. Um, on that, members, is there any other business? Probably no. not. Then we will meet again on the 22nd of April at 2 o'clock, uh, notwithstanding us coming back and informing you beforehand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 30.